All right. So nutrition to reduce pain and inflammation. Does anyone here think that that really can work? Okay, good. Because we now know through years of study that the thing we used to hear about when we were kids, you are what you eat, is getting truer and truer the more research we do. So what do we need? Optimum nutrition. What is that? We'll talk about it. Nutritional supplements because our food is not that great anymore. So we need to supplement that with natural things. Detoxification of the body is very, very important because we're picking up toxins as we speak here right now, as we sit here. And hormonal balance is also very, very important. So what are the top causes of pain and inflammation? Unbalanced fatty acids from diet and supplements. Too much AA, that's arachidonic acid. Anyone ever hear of that? Anyone know what the greatest food is for arachidonic acid? Red meat, unless it's grass-fed. And we'll get into that. The other part of it is too little omega-3s. Those are anti-inflammatory. Arachidonic acid is pro-inflammatory, which we don't like. Omega-3s, which we find in fish oil and some other things. Flaxseed, nuts, fish, grass-fed beef. High omega-3, helps reduce the inflammation. Excess body fat around the waist. How much of us have that? How many here in the room? Okay. That, improves, that produces inflammatory signals, tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. They all increase C-reactive protein. Everyone have their blood taken, have a C-reactive protein taken? What does that do when it's high? It causes heart disease. Inflammation causes heart disease. What we eat causes heart disease. This is something that I loved so much in medical school all the pathways around the body and our metabolism. It's endless, endless pathways. It's very, very complex. What is this? This is a cell, a single cell. When you look under a, an electron microscope, you see all these little organelles, which are little, like cities inside of a country. And everything that I learned in medical school was so amazing because we're so complex. Cutting open a body, you would see like different universes of activity that take place. And how they all work together is just an amazing feature. The deeper we go into the cellular level, the more complex it gets and the more fascinating it gets. Other causes of pain and inflammation, excess carbohydrate intake from starches, fruits, sugars. Anyone here think fruits can be bad for you? Yes. Yeah, because it has fructose in it. Is that terrible? It can be if you're of the genetic disposition that you're sensitive and you have some type of dysglycemia, meaning that your sugar is not metabolized very well. So here it is. Stimulates excess insulin production, which revs up inflammation. Insulin is a hormone that stores fat. That's the purpose of it. Now at one time in our history, not too long ago, diabetes was genetically selected. Anyone can believe that diabetes could be good? If people were living to 30, 35, diabetes was great because you'd have some sugar to eat, carbs to eat in the summer, get fat, you make it through the winter. Guys like me wouldn't make it. I'm already down to the bone. So actually, to be honest with you, I have to eat fruit and I eat a lot of brown rice to help keep a little bit of fat on me, what little I have. But most people don't have that. I have a very fast metabolism. I'm called ectomorphic. Anyone hear about that? We're the guys that don't sleep at night because our nerves are on the surface. We're always thinking. And then most people are more mesodorphic, more muscular, and more endomorphic, more slower thinking, more relaxed. They need a little caffeine to wake them up in the morning. So the big deal with excess insulin, which we get from eating improperly, is high insulin. High insulin causing insulin resistance. You've heard of that? After a while, we can't produce enough. Our bodies are getting so big, there's so many cells, we can't feed it all with enough insulin. So we become insulin resistant. What does that mean? There's a lot of insulin floating around in the blood, not enough to bring the sugar into the cells to be used for energy. What happens with insulin? It actually blocks our fat cells from releasing the free fatty acids, which we would like to use for energy. Okay, it's very easy for us in our office to get you on a program where you burn fat. When people start a program, they typically lose about 10 pounds in one week, 30 pounds in three months. Is it easy to do? It's very, very easy to do. 
It's not dieting. We don't do any diets. We don't use the diet word. We use nutrition because it's not something that you do to lose weight. It's something you do to get healthy. Now, you lose weight in the, in the, in the meantime. We don't have people getting on scales. We have them check their, their clothes size. You know, your pants hanging down, time to get new pants. Great thing. You know, everyone's heard the term anti-aging, right? Anyone ever not heard that word? It's pretty wild on the west side. And we all want to be anti-aging people. And what that has to do most of all of anything else is how much blood glucose that we have in our bloodstream. How much glucose do we have at one time? If it's high, we're going to glycosylate our cells, our proteins, with sugar. It makes them sticky. Anyone ever cook with sugar? What does it do to the food? Sticky. Makes it sticky. Makes it, it browns it up, makes it taste great. But what it does to our cells, it makes them dysfunctional. So they cannot produce proper hormones, proper neurotransmitters, all the things that our genetics are there for to make us heal, make us feel great. So what does this do? It causes premature aging. Now, when I was in medical school, we were taught the different theories of aging, one of which was aged glycosylated end products. I pulled that out from far away. Um, what that means is a lot of sugar in the blood glycosylates blood cells. When we look at hemoglobin A1C, does anyone know what that blood marker is? You know, check for diabetes. As people get older in their 50s, even if they don't have diabetes, they can generate diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, which is middle-aged diabetes, unfortunately, young kids are getting it now, mostly in Latino populations, because their, their main source of food is carbohydrate. But what happens with these red blood cells is they become glycosylated, and if they're glycosylated in an oversaturation, the blood cells will actually sink faster, and you have a high hemoglobin A1C. Now, we can change that. Does anyone here have type 2 diabetes? They're willing to share the information? Okay. If you do have it, it's not a disease because we can reverse that overnight for you. <clears throat> it's not rocket science. It's easy to do. We change the foods you eat. We don't deprive you of foods. We change them such that when you eat, the insulin does not jump up, the glucose does not jump up. We don't want that repetitive cycle going on of sugar bouncing up, insulin bouncing up, driving the sugar down, making you miserable, making you reach for more sugar because what happens when the insulin jumps, sugar is down, we feel dizzy, we feel foggy, we feel more pain in our body, we feel fatigue, we need some more caffeine, sometimes a cigarette will help. All these things we really want to stay away from. So what are we wanting to do? We want to keep your system involved with fairly high protein, fairly high vegetables, and a lot of water. That's basically it. Now people say, well, that's a low-carb diet. It's not. Vegetables are carbohydrates. Unless you're working out very heavily like an elite athlete, you really don't need a lot of high glycemic carbohydrates. But vegetables give you all, of, basically all of the carbohydrates you need to have good energy function. And if your sugar and insulin are not bouncing all day and we can keep them constant for you, you're going to feel great. Just doing that alone. People feel more energy within a couple of days. Most grains, legumes, which are beans, peas, lentils, soybeans, green beans, can cause inflammation. How do they do that? They have something called lectins in them. What do they do? They have detrimental effects because they cause gut irritation. How many people have bloating and gas in here? You do our nutrition plan, that's gone instantaneously within a day. And you go, wow, I guess it wasn't me, it was the food I was eating. Leaky gut, everyone ever heard of leaky gut syndrome? In the gut, we have what are called tight junctions between the cells. They hold the food in so it can go down the digestive tract, get digested properly, instead of these cells opening up through inflammation by eating poor foods, dairy products, grains, things of that nature, and having these cells open up, leak out proteins before they're digested. If you have proteins circulating in your blood, you are going to have pain and misery, headaches, foggy thinking. Blurry vision. I mean, the list goes on for pages. So what do we do? We heal the gut first. Very, very important. We change the nutrition. We use supplements. So leaky gut, lectins, what do they cause? Arthritis. Why? What happens when your joints have proteins in them, undigested? They don't like that. It's poisonous to them. 
antibodies react what do we think all of these autoimmune diseases are from?